Hey everyone, welcome to Group Text. Now, as you guys know, I'm not usually at a loss for words when introducing my guests, but today I actually am. Kevin Abrams is the director of the powerful, unflinching documentary, I Got a Monster, now available for rent and purchase on iTunes, Amazon, Instant Video, and Vudu. Ivan Bates, the new state attorney's general for Baltimore City, is the driving force of the film, I Got a Monster, which tells the story of epic police corruption, which took place at the hands of Baltimore City's Gun Trace Task Force and Ivan Bates' role in defending the victims of that corruption. Please welcome Kevin Abrams and Ivan Bates. Um, I was just saying to you guys, I got, I was fortunate I got to watch, okay, I got to watch for free, um, the documentary. <laughs> we won't tell our distributor. <laughs> Please don't. Um, it's, it's heavy. It's heavy going. It's based on a book, I Got a Monster, by Banyard Brooks and Brandon Soderbergh. And it's about the gun trace task force scandal in Baltimore and the 2017, I want to make sure I get this right, federal indictment of the task force ringleader, Officer Wayne Jenkins, along with six other officers. Now, who approached whom about making a documentary about their book? Baynard approached me, Baynard, one of the writers in the book, approached our production company about making a documentary. We worked on several projects previously over the years, forged a really great friendship. We're very like-minded in the stories we wanted to tell. And he approached us and the version he initially sold into us was the sensational version, the one that you could imagine as the sequel to Training Day, right? You know, corrupt cop doing all this nutty stuff. It's Serpico meets Denzel at his worst, blah, 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 blah. But as we began to really dig into the storytelling, we realized that not only was the the sensational elements of, of what they initially presented us not really the story, it also wasn't really what needed to be told, which was giving voice to the victims. Now, when we made that decision, that's when Baynard and Brandon introduced us to Ivan. Ivan was representing a ton of them. He helped facilitate our ability to meet them, hear their stories, and also walked us through a lot of the, the broad macro elements of the case that he was putting together and that he discovered over the years just by defending these people. Why don't you explain the title? Because I found this fascinating because I was wondering when I saw the title, what I got a monster means because it's not what you would think it comes from. Yeah, it's it's a little twist on expectation. It actually came from Wayne Jenkins himself, the the corrupt cop or the cop at the center of the scandal. When he found somebody that he wanted to quote unquote sting, he would call up his uh, fellow police officers, and the code was "I got a monster," and that meant that he found a target. And that they were going to go after him and or her or them and rob and steal and or frame them for something usually ended up just being straight up stealing and uh, that was his way we think of justifying a bit of the behavior by framing it through that that vantage point so ivan here you are doing your good deeds and being an incredible attorney and uh, both sides like a lot of lawyers you started as a prosecutor and then switched to defense. First of all, why? I always want to ask lawyers, like, why you do that? Um, and how, okay, so they, you've been a part of this, the whole thing, and then they come to you and Kevin's like, hi, I'm Kevin, nice to meet you. Um, do you mind if we do a documentary and basically invade your life? Not only am I Kevin, I'm Kevin from Los Angeles, who has nothing to do with Baltimore <laughs> yeah. or any of this. Because, yeah, when Kevin, when I see you, I think urban immediately. Yeah, I mean, rough, well, living in the rough street. streets of Topanga yeah. Canyon. Yeah, I mean, maybe a bar mitzvah <laughs> documentary, I could have been the first call, but this one, not so much. Yeah, like I always say to my son, you come from the tough streets of, of Pacific Palisades. You are battle hardened, my friend, from standing in line at Air One. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I was a right, I was a prosecutor for at first, and then I became a defense attorney. The biggest reason back then was I had student loans that were due, and you know, unfortunately, being a prosecutor is public servant. I I did six years. I moved to the defense side. The beauty of being a defense attorney was that I felt I could help a lot of people and. This year, when I began to see the police corruption, you know, Wayne Jenkins just didn't happen overnight. 
I was, I had over almost 33 cases with Wayne Jenkins. I've seen him in the first part of his life where he was an officer who was working with another officer named Gladstone. They did a number of cases and you began to see the corruption there, but no one really blew the whistle until finally under the previous, under a former state's attorney named Greg Bernstein, his prosecutor, Molly Webb, blew, blew the whistle. They tried to get rid of Wayne Jenkins. We thought that we had gotten rid of him for his corruption. Only the new state's attorney, Marilyn Mosby, came into office and she reinstated him. And when she reinstated him, he became a bigger, badder version of himself. At that moment in time, I kind of really took it upon myself, knowing who he was, and I would find cases and I would take those cases half price and I knew what he was doing. I was My hope was to find that big case that I could really bring attention to the corruption that he was doing. I felt like after watching this, and like you said, 30 something cases, like you need, you needed like a punch card and whoever was like the last defendant, yes. hey, yeah. and you got the free, you get a free <laughs> latte. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it was like that in a lot of ways. I mean, he, Wayne and I knew each other very, very well. We danced an awful lot in court together. Yes, you did. And you had so much incredible, you gave Kevin such incredible access. And and we're going to get into sort of the minutia of some of these, but you're so emotionally invested in this, the taking this man down. And it, it comes across that you're so emotionally invested in your client. How were you able to, to, to do the work because sometimes you have to be um step take a step back and say yes your case has is good or no i can't take your case in in these cases because they're so emotional where did you finally say this is i have enough and we're gonna get this guy or no you don't your case isn't convincing enough to be a part of this almost it's not a class action but that there are so many people that you know, make it's any sense. It, yeah, it makes a <laughs> lot of sense. You know, for me, remember, in the documentary, it also talks about this woman, the sergeant office, police officer named Ale uh, Alicia White. So I was representing her. Representing her, I began to understand a lot of the police world, how police are able to put together cases, what they're supposed to do. Understanding that. But let's explain who she is. This She was part of the Freddie Gray, Gray. case. She which was. Which was in, in, in 2016, if people don't remember, Freddie Gray died in police custody and it was one of the early incidents of, of this kind of police behavior that got a lot of national attention it, and it did and getting that national attention really helped opened up my eyes because i represented her to what police should and shouldn't do and it was interesting as i'm being vilified for representing her i'm seeing what wayne jenkins is really doing so as i'm being yelled at and cursed at and screamed at by the public during her case i'm going to the jail finding cases that Wayne Jenkins and his team had and taking those cases. I recognize right from wrong. I'm real big about this system should work this way and the integrity of the system. Um, and so for me, I would find a client, it wasn't about what they did, it was about what they had been accused of and did that police get them constitutionally the correct way. Now, you know, when I looked at what Wayne had done, Wayne just crossed the threshold that meant the entire system on itself was gonna be held captive by his, his actions good policing, bad policing, but good officers doing good things. And the citizens must believe in the system and the integrity of the system. And Wayne stood for everything that I was against. And so for me, that's why it became a call to try to make sure we do the right thing where I was representing Alicia White, who stood for what everything I believe the good officer had, should do that was in a bad position, as opposed to Wayne Jenkins, who was a corrupt officer that needed to go to jail. Um, what I like, is, Kevin, is you stay away from the whole few bad apples explanation. Um, and you, you really do dive into that this is a systemic problem within, um, and it's not unique to any specific area, but obviously it's in more of the underserved communities that you see this. How unfettered is the authority of the police in these particular communities? I mean, it feels very unfettered and it's it's pretty shocking. I remember one incident where I was uh, filming one of the the people that appear in the film and it wasn't the best part of the 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 city. I'm sitting there with a tripod at a gas station shooting from a long lens across the street as has conversations with people. Cop pulls up to me, gets out of the car and he's like, hey, you shouldn't be here. 
I'm like, why shouldn't I be here? He's like, well, this isn't a good area. I was like, okay, well, I'm going to be here. I, I'm making a documentary. And he's like, okay, well, I'm just going to wait with you and stay here to make sure you're safe. Now, if I was not white, that never would have happened to <laughs> anybody else. This guy's patrolling an area where I'm sure there's a thousand other possible things that he could be doing. And he decided to sit next to the white guy in the minivan with a camera. Now, is that showing anything besides class and race possibly? Sure, but to me, it's more going back to your question, it is showing a bit of the unfettered ways that these cops navigate through this area. Later on that day, we have footage that's in the film of two guys getting pulled over by police officers that were shooting from drones. And from what we could tell, it was just a traffic stop. So this is what seems to be at play in these type of environments. And we had a lot of impunity because of what we were doing and obviously who we were, but other people, and you can just AB them with the stories of the people that we interview in the film, do not get to live with that type of impunity. And it's obviously that a lot of these things are very targeted and it's heartbreaking because you see these stories. And one of the things that the cops specific in our films did were able to target people that they knew had violent crime histories, they had uh, histories and of you know crime in general. So they were able to target them, opportunize those arrests and do stuff that they knew they can get away with because nobody was gonna listen to them because they had these problematic histories. So all of these conversations, the, the apparent ends up being the inev inevitable conclusion. What you think usually is what is actually playing out. And for us, the the crazy thing about it was we just never thought that it was this blatant. And you see it within the film with the behavior of Jenkins. His behavior was incredibly blatant. It was happening in front of all these people's eyes. They were screaming for attention. Ivan was screaming. Nobody was acknowledging it. And it took this massive you know, intervention from the FBI and, and a federal government agency to actually properly account for bad behavior that was going on for he years that people knew about. And you brought up, uh, it was so brazen. Yeah. That when you watch the film, I mean, there's even that one, one story where they had the audacity to actually take this gentleman's keys drive him home, make him sit in the car while they went in and robbed his house. But then, if that's not enough, one of the officers gives him his card and says, hey, if you need anything. And the other I crazy thing, yeah, like I you mean. just go, are yeah. you fucking kidding me? No, it's insane. Yeah. I mean, one of the people, they parked the car across from a precinct. And they went up to his house without a warrant. And he's like, you're going to go up to the house without a warrant? And he, this was right across from a police precinct. They're literally breaking and entering in front of a police precinct. And the guy's, you know, handcuffed in the back seat. And they're doing this like it's, you know, Monday, 9 a.m. morning meeting. I, I mean, things like that, you like your jaw is on the ground. One of the first stories that you follow, in, follow Ivan on is the couple who were because you brought up they targeted people who really had records in this. This is a completely lovely upper middle class couple who happen to be African American, who run a catering party planning business and had cash in their car going actually going to the bank. That's the the great it, it felt like in the beginning, it felt like Wayne Jenkins knew what he was targeting. And then it felt like it was just like a free for all. And that's what was so crazy. That story in particular, it really ruined these people's lives. Yeah. And, you know, they they managed it with as much integrity and grace as I could imagine anybody doing it. And to this day, they never got their money back that was taken away from them by Jenkins and the fellow officer. They got, I think they found like a gram of marijuana and they both ended up having bail set somewhere between $500,000, Ivan. It was, and, I think it was almost a yeah, million each. Almost a million, yeah, yeah. combined. Yeah. 
So they had to post that. I mean, the record followed the, the woman for years. She worked with kids. So yeah, this was something. I believe she was a yeah, teacher. Right. She was a, a nurse practitioner. Nurse practitioner. Yeah. And she can't mm -hmm. work anymore. She, she couldn't. Uh, but also, you have to remember, they did this in front of their children. So their children, you know, and then you had officers lying. Um, it was really bad. You know, that was the first, when I say that, that was the opportunity of God and Wayne. We talked to him. We thought we were going to get him. But then they let him go. And you're right, because what happened was that Wayne became more and more emboldened. He began, look, and I, I've said this before, if you did not know that this was real life, you would swear it was a movie. And that's what holds you. But it's actually true. It's really true. And what you get is that the police department was so wanting to have numbers to throw out there that they let Wayne Jenkins do anything. They knew he had these issues. They promoted him. And But I think also what you saw, unfortunately, was a dark blemish in Baltimore's history. We had a number of individuals in public office. They did the, anything, anything, anything. Look, we had a police commissioner. He was indicted, who was one of the individuals that, that Wayne Jenkins also, you know, uh, uh, reported to. We've had mayors. You know, we've had a number of issues, public elected officials. And so I think what you have is you have individuals that can beat up the African-American community, can get away with it because no one's going to stand up and have their back. And that's why I think it's so unique about the documentary is because it tells a story from those individuals' point of views and, hey, we're victims, but also the role of defense attorneys to show how important what they do. Now, with us, I was looking for that big case. When I found that big case, the feds reached out. I won that case, and I knew the feds were going to reach out because I knew the system. And when the feds reached out, that's when I was able to take my client, who went reluctantly, and his wife, and I had all the other information, having been a prosecutor, putting all that material together with not just that case, but multiple other cases in a form and fashion that the U.S. Attorney's Office could use it to prosecute all those officers. Okay, let's, let's roll back a little bit and talk about Wayne Jenkins and his history because it's pretty fascinating. Yeah. Um, he was, he started, he, well, you tell the story, he started out just as your regular police officer. Yeah, regular police officer. He, you know, was always known for being ambitious, always known for being on the aggressive side of policing. He seemed like he, there was a part of him that wanted to move up the ranks. And I think that energy and that side of his personality really galvanized his ability to do it. But he was also an incredibly intelligent human being. So he knew how to gamify roughly the system and to allow things to happen in a way that led to promotion, led to greater freedoms in his policing capability, and eventually ended up taking him to the version of Wayne Jenkins we see in the in the film. And explain what so he raises up the ranks, and he suddenly he's he's tasked with putting together this gun trace task force. Mm -hmm. What was the intention of this task force? Well, you know, I'll set it up quickly, and Ivan can dive into it. Baltimore historically has a high murder rate. And one of yeah. the things that they always are trying to do is bring it down. It seems like historically there's a lot of conversation that equates uh, gun possession with the murder rate. So the task force basically is trying to get guns off the street in the hope that that will eventually bring down the murder rate and, and gun crime. And Ivan, you can take it from there. Yeah, yeah, during that time period, right after Freddie Graham, murder rate jumped tremendously. And so the thought was that, hey, if we get illegal handguns off individuals, they won't have these illegal handguns. We can arrest them and they won't shoot and kill individuals. And so, so look, it makes a lot of sense. Um, however, the problem is that when you're doing that, there were no checks and balances for these officers that, you know, Wayne Jenkins, a lot of these officers, you find out they came up the ranks together. You had Gladstone as a supervisor promoter. You had, you know, Dean Paul Mayer, who was a deputy police commissioner who knew Wayne Jenkins back when they were in division. So these officers, all Sean Miller, they all came up the ranks together. And so, you know, some of them you find out even they they had relationships before they got to the police department, you know, with one another. So they watched each other's back. And so what happened once after we had Wayne Jenkins almost being, you know, they looked at him to potentially charge him criminally. Then they don't. And then he comes back. The police department doesn't say, what did you do? The police department promotes him. The country trace task force where they take officers from around the city. Normally, you have different districts, nine police districts, and the officers patrol the di police districts. 
They gave Wayne Jenkins the opportunity to go anywhere in the city that he wanted to, which is the criminal crime in terms of promotions, so that he could go and rob any Peter, Paul, whoever he wanted to. He'd stop you, get your driver's license, figure out where you live. If he could find it, something to arrest you on that was small there, he was going to your house, take your keys, open your door, find guns, drugs, money, anything, and leave. And so that was their motive. And, you know, having had so many cases with him, I knew how he thought. I knew how he moved. I knew everything that he was going to do. And so, you know, it was very interesting. But that's what they were doing. And part of the reason I think they were so desperate, we began their transition to police officers using body camera footage. He knew the jig was almost up and he needed to get as many individuals that he could before everybody had to wear body cameras. How did he, you know, he feels very like mafia bossy in a way to me. He really feels like a brilliant con man in a way. How did he recruit his crew? Because it was literally a crew. There's no other way to put it. Yeah, we always- Including one guy who would fence everything. Yeah, he. they had a long history. He was a friend of the family. They played poker together with, you know, there was a game in town. They became friends. They knew what each other was up to. And Donnie is very open and honest, the fence, who um, also did time because of this case and why he thought it was great to partner with Wayne, because he figured if I partner with the cop, I'm going to have a lot better protection. So I'm going to fence these drugs and stuff that he stole. But one of the interesting elements, too, and we talk about it, he got assigned people with problematic histories. Two cops in particular, this one cop, uh, Detective Gondo, was being investigated at the time by the feds for his participation in, in a heroin distribution racket. Another, oops. Uh, oops, another guy, Detective Hersel, Danny Hersel, and Ivan can talk to him, is notorious within internal affairs yeah. for having one of the longest standing problematic uh, policing histories in recent Baltimore policing. And they all got put together, these people. So do you think Jenkins, they thought that he was gonna straighten them out or? Well, this is an interesting footnote. Do you want to talk about this, Ivan? You go ahead. <laughs> so so basically, th what ended up happening is these cops get put together. Gondo was getting investigated by the feds for his participation with this, you know, heroin organization that people are aware of. The initial thought, and we have this in the film, the FBI talking about that, was when they found out that Gondo was under Jenkins's supervision, they were going to approach Jenkins to work with them to try to take down Gondo. For some reason, they paused on this conversation and through wiretaps, they discovered Gondo having incredibly sketchy conversations with Jenkins. And then it became apparent that Jenkins was, if not the ringleader, doing stuff comparable as far as illegal behavior and maneuvering. So it becomes this really delicate notion of fate having a huge part in bringing him down. But initially, they were going to capitalize on Jenkins' position to deal with the other bad cops. But how do all these bad cops end up on the same task force? I think One that's of, my more basic question. Like, did Jenkins say, I want him, 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 and him? Or was it just this bizarre twist of fate that all these bad guys ended up together? Because, you know, like finds like. Yeah. And the answer is a bizarre twist of fate. But it, also, it go ahead, go ahead, Ivan. I was going to say, so part of the, there were a couple officers that were already with Wayne in his previous division, his previous unit. So he already knew they were dirty. And then he also then knew, everybody knew Herschel was dirty. And then you also had Gondo and Ram, and he had known the rumblings. So these officers, look, we had some major issues in terms of the systemic policing issues in Baltimore City is one of the reasons we're under consent decree. They all know who they were. And there were quite a few terrible acts. They weren't bad. They were horrific individuals that were policing. So I think it was pretty easy to realize these are the individuals that were gravitating to where that, that, that police work. There were the individuals that was, you know, real quick money. You get a drug dealer, you arrest them. They have $2,000 on them. You take a thousand and then the other thousand you turn in. What's the drug dealer going to say? You stole my money. That was, you know, and so that's what was the thought process with that. So they they knew one another. You know, we we, we started to talk about uh, internal affairs, and I found this fascinating. First of all, and I don't know if this is, to, I don't want to come off saying that it's in 
internal affairs fault. But I feel like the whole police system has given, has made internal affairs toothless. You know, that nobody's scared about being investigated by internal affairs because nothing comes to light. And Ivan, you actually talk quite a bit about this is lawyers do not have access to police officers' internal affairs records. And I, and I watch a lot of law and order. Let's just preface <laughs> with that. Okay. I am shocked by that. Shocked that you can't go into internal affairs and, and, you know, it's, it's part of discovery. It's part of prior bad acts or good acts, whatever it is. You know, I just want to say Jerry Orbach would have found a, would not have ever allowed that to be. I'm just saying. He would have shut it down fast. Yeah. No, know. I mean, do you want to talk about that? Because it, it's still, it's a very huge topic across both aisles in, in Baltimore with, with yeah, the, very the lawyers. Because so. one, do you want to say they should have, you know, you know, attorney client privilege, but on the other hand, Guys like Jenkins used it to their advantage because they could not reveal, and I don't want to give away too much of the documentary, but there is a moment where Ivan, you're like, I have footage. And the other attorney, the prosecution, didn't want to even see it. Well, you know, it's funny, right there, not only did he not want to see it, but he was the one who gave me the video footage. So he didn't even <laughs> look at the footage that he gave me. And so that was the problem that you have with the, the state's attorney's office under the Bar administration that said, hey, we're going to do whatever we want because at the end of the day, the ends justify the means. They wanted conviction numbers. That's all they wanted. Also, back then, a lot has changed in the legislature. They changed the law because they were only viewed as police uh, personnel records. You know, there was called a law enforcement officer's bill of rights. They got rid of that. So it doesn't protect the officers as much. And it's funny with me now being the state's attorney, I'm on the opposite side of that argument. You know, like, well, how much do we give? How much do we not give? And so a lot of that has really changed. It's still evolving. It's still changing. The other thing to me that's very important here is that now the police department is under consent decree. A lot of it had to do because of this as well. And, and what does that mean? Decree, what does that mean? Basically, basically, that we have a federal judge who watches what's going on with the reimagining uh, reconstruction of Baltimore City Police Department. Certain things they used to be able to do, they can't do their checks and balances. Now, if you do have violations, you do have uh, a stronger ability to be kicked off the force. We've had more officers retire, more officers leave the force than before. A lot of it has to do because of change of culture. The biggest thing that the consent decree is trying to do is change the culture of policing to say policing is about the people and not about a group of individuals decide to run it like an outlaw organization. And just to give a little context, it, it's 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 a federal mandate. So it, it, part yes. of what it is important about that is that it's it's taking it out of the local thing and holding it to different standards so that people involved locally cannot manipulate it to their 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 benefits. It's it really is, you know, you really scratch your head. And when I was thinking about this the other day, which I found interesting, is it comes down to greed and that these people's lives were irreparably damaged because of one man's greed. And this man is brilliant. I mean, he's, he's you know, he's no better than, than Bernie Madoff. At, yeah. at, but with a badge. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I mean, yes. he was he wasn't operating out of the Hamptons, but yeah, <laughs> different. Yeah. yeah. And you know, remember Wayne Jenkins took a, a oath. He took an oath to defend and serve and protect. When I say the average criminal, they don't they don't take those oaths. So that's why I look at holding the police at a higher standard because you promised, you took an oath, you swore to protect the citizens that you're preying upon. So that's why I just view him as absolutely being despicable in his actions. Oh, he's a horrible horrible human being <laughs> i'm not sure that there's any other way to look at him but he's brilliant yeah and the bernie yeah. madoff things is, is an interesting um analogy because he was able to you know front load 
his information in ways that protected what he was doing underneath all of this. So he showed profits, he showed, you know, 20% returns, he was giving money back to a certain amount of people. It was very data driven. So underneath that, he was able to accomplish all these terrible things. Jenkins did the same exact things. He got the arrest. He showed people that he was putting people behind bars. He got guns specifically, whether he planted them or not. He was dealing with one of the things that they wanted numerically to show that they were addressing in the city. Underneath all these types of things, he was still doing the sketchy, incredible stuff that he was doing, but he presented the facade that allowed for this to happen, which is why it's just, it's it's really insidious in a different way. Another layer of the documentary, Ivan, you and Wayne play cat and mouse. Yeah. And yeah. that during one of sort of the, um, again, I don't want to give it away, um, pivotal moments, Wayne realizes you've got him and turns the tables in a way that basically screws up your case, but better for the victim. And yeah. it's, it's, did you realize that you were dealing with someone who was as smart as you, or maybe even strangely smarter? It really is cat and mouse. Well, I knew everything about Wayne. I had 33 cases. You know, I would go into the jail and look for cases that Wayne Jenkins' name was on because I realized that people were were bamboozled by the charisma, by his intelligence. But I also knew that Wayne had a fatal flaw, which was he was greedy. And he kept doing the same thing over and over and over again once I realized his M.O. And that's why you do see some of the moves that I made. That's why I had that one particular witness so I knew when he walked past. But I also recognized Wayne knew how serious this was because he knew what I knew. And, he, and so when you also have a scene where we talk at the elevator, and we had that scene, and that's his way of ad admitting to me that, hey, I'm done, I'm out, leave me alone. And so, you know, it was very interesting in the sense that I finally beat Wayne at his own game, but to beat him at his own game, I had to think like Wayne. And so I had to outmaneuver him. And so I think being a criminal defense attorney, that was a skill set that I had begun to develop understanding. Um, but I also think that Wayne didn't realize it until it was too late. But there's also a scene early on where he, he, let's just say, you know, there's a note and there's a reason he didn't want me to be the lawyer in the case at the very beginning was because he knew. And, you know, we, we, like I said, you have 33 cases with individual. I lost a lot of cases early on, but I quickly won a lot near the end. And there's a lovely ironic little coda with uh, his case and Ivan that... I sort of want to talk about, but we should save it for the movie. But it it, it shows the eventual respect yeah. that that he has for Ivan and and for what type of uh, lawyer he became. Um, this is probably the tightest documentary I've ever seen. You, Kevin, are credited as an editor along with, which is crazy, six other people. There is literally not an ounce of fact <laughs> on, on this documentary. How did you know what to cut and what to keep? It was, I mean, honestly, COVID. COVID really was the mirror. We sold this film. We had it set up at a, a large streamer. It was going to be a five-episode, real in-depth analysis of the system, systemic issues with police corruption. In the 12th hour, it fell apart. They changed the regime. We're literally in contract phase. And by that time, we accumulated a ton of footage because I was like, I don't know if I'm going to get to these people again. Let's just shoot. Ivan set up some great interviews. So we just for two years filmed. Our first cut was about two hours, 45 minutes. And um, we began toe dipping in the festival circuit as opposed to seeing if we can resell it. We didn't get into a couple of festivals. And I just regrouped at that time with my producers and EPs. And I was like, listen, I want to take an ax to this. And I think right now we're seeing Ivan as our central character. Let's reframe this from this larger systemic thing and really try to make it about one person, the people around it, and just lean it out. And that was right in the middle of COVID. So I had a lot of time to look at the footage in the film. And after six, seven additional months of editing, we got it down to this hour, 35 minute version, and it ended up working. It's You indict sort of both, indicting the police in both the court system and the court of public opinion is very tricky. And 
potentially very dangerous. Did either of you ever feel in, in diving into this and your persistence of, of chasing down Jenkins, did you ever feel anxious or in danger? I remember- Especially you, Ivan, because you, you're the one taking the stick and poking the bear. That's a good question. I, I'm curious what your thoughts are. We we never talked about that. You know, um, look, look, I have a, look I, first of all, I have a deep faith and belief in, in, in God protecting. But more importantly, you remember, I represented Sergeant Alicia White in the Freddie Gray matter. So the police already were loving me because I, quote unquote, stood up for them. The community loved me because I stood up for them. You know, look, I'm the state's attorney now and the police actually guard me. You know, and protect me. So, you know, you talk about going around all types of circles. You know, I think for me, I'm real big on how you treat how you treat people. Um, I, you know, I think my reputation preceded me. Um, if it was meant to be, it's time to go. It's nothing I can really do about it. But I've represented some really terrible criminals in my time period. I was probably, I thought about Wayne. I thought about some of the other individuals, some of the other officers. I stuck to the facts. I don't, you know, veer off from what I can't prove. And, you know, um, did it good? Did a thought cross my mind? Oh, yeah, without a doubt. And, you know, I, I, I try to live my life in a certain way, don't hang out certain places and try to keep myself as hidden as and small as possible. I thought about it, but I didn't let it control me. How did it affect your personal lives? I know, because I, mean, I, I don't know, Ivan, if you have a family, what do you have? And, Kevin, you're off with your chickens in Topanga Canyon. <laughs> we'll, <laughs> save you you egg. we'll save you some eggs. We'll save you some eggs. I see that you have on a ring. How did it affect those around you and your loved ones? Um, you know, it was a very tough time period of my life from campaign. Another day, I was married, divorced. Um, but I think really what it was, I just get so engrossed in my work. And then I think that's what it became. You know, I think my ex-wife even said it was almost like an obsession. You see her, at the, you know in the movie um but i have a, a little girl and one of the reasons now my new life one of the reasons i decided to run from state's attorney and leave being a criminal defense attorney was because i hate the state of the city and i wanted to provide a better city for my daughter so in that regard i think you know you, there was some terrible things you buy any you go through a divorce it's very hurtful you don't want to go through that process but also something positive came out about it I won the state's attorney's position. Um, look, I'm happy to say right now, crime is going down little by little in our city. I've been here six months, and a lot of people feel that we've begun to turn that page. And I think having been on both sides, people believe that I'm bringing uh, uh, respect and justice back to the criminal justice system. So that, to me, is very positive. So I always ask this because I'm always, you know, I'm curious. Like, Kevin, what is next? And one of the reasons I ask you this is, the brilliant women who made the documentary about my mother mm -hmm. had just finished making a documentary about the Sudan and oh, then wow. hard pivot to Joan River. <laughs> I mean, listen, that's, that's what the beauty are, of being a documentarian is you can do that. What light and fuzzy topic are you <laughs> pivoting to next? <laughs> well, following the comedy that I seem to really chase down these days, I have a fiction feature coming out in September. It's about a young girl who uh, ends up being a dreamer. It takes place on the Texas-Mexican border. A young girl discovers that she's undocumented and the emotional fallout for, from that. We are right now in post-production on a documentary about the Afghan refugee crisis, so another great you know sitcom type of project and uh i mean those are what we got on the plate now i did promise myself that there would be something a little bit lighter in the future but you know i i hate to be such a topanga predictable human being but there's stuff to fight against right now and it's tough for me to want to make a light comedy when all so much crap is happening Okay, but I have an idea. I just want to pitch it out. Done. Let's hear it. Done in the in the docu world. And Ivan, I've already planned your f future as well. We'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, just run with me on this one. A gritty expose on the truth behind cooking shows. Oh my God, I would love to. I've done, listen, I come out of reality TV. I can, I, can, I know what's underneath that skillet. <laughs> and <laughs> Ivan, I... Once you're done with the whole political thing, I'm thinking Judge Ivan seems too basic. 
<laughs> I'm thinking about something along the lines of the legal version of Dr. Phil. Oh my God, that'd be yeah. epic. Just run with me on this. <laughs> I, you know what? I would be more than happy to do that. <laughs> I'm sure I'm, you know, public public service I enjoy. But let's just say you, I did take a pay cut for that. And I do have a young girl, a little girl who needs to go to college one day. So I look more than happy to, to doing a job like that. Dude. Well, thank, thank you guys for bringing this documentary to the, pe to the people because it is, I mean, you really do sit there with your mouth hanging open. And, and like you put it, it, it doesn't it doesn't feel like it, it could actually have happened. And the fact that it happened so brazenly is just you. It really takes a minute to get your mind around it. I got a monster now available in select theaters as well as available for rent and purchase on iTunes, Amazon Instant Video and Voodoo. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.